a, uh, what we call a VB Extra, which is a little bit different than a panel uh, presentation, and this one's going to be even more different. It's going to uh, have our three winners from the Next Gen AIAA conference that occurred earlier this week. And to uh, start off this VB Extra, I'm going to introduce my friend Mario Cipendi, my my Moog colleague, and I would say my favorite. Mo colleague in Huntsville, but you're just one of my favorite colleagues at all. So come on up, Mary. What he forgot to say is I'm one of the few Mo people in Huntsville. So first, um, obviously, I have quite an honor to be able to introduce to you the winners of the technical presentations um, that were judged by panels of their peers. Um, but I do want to certainly give a big shout out to all of you who stayed. So you got a you got a break, a 20 minute break, and you didn't leave. There's another panel after this, which is gonna make your day longer. And I think it's gonna be a very interesting panel, but you didn't leave for that either. So I think you're gonna enjoy the last uh, hour or so session that we have planned for you. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, as Chris alluded to, there was an AIAA Young Professionals Next Generation um, event that occurred on Monday and Tuesday of this week. Um, this kind of is a greater southeast focus that brings together innovators, researchers, engineers, technical presentations are made, there are workshops, there's actually a little bit of career speed dating that was offered, and as it's an annual event, they try to expand on this every year, and for next year, they're actually going to try to include um, a classified section. So. Uh, Logicor was the company that hosted that event, um, which is also in Cummings Research Park. So um, at the conclusion of the event, there were um, about 35 technical presentations that were judged. The top three were selected, and those gentlemen are with us today. Um, I'd like to start with Dr. David Nover. He is a senior technical fellow with People Tech. Um, quite a distinguished academic career, not to mention what he's done professionally since. He earned his PhD from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. Um, also went to Princeton University for his Bachelor's of Science in Theoretical Physics. Um, he's authored more than 100 technical uh, publications, which include research articles and book chapters. Um, his role today with PeopleTech focuses primarily on machine learning, algorithms, and data mining. So please help me welcome Dr. David Nover. All right, so I, I want to take five minutes to convince you that these are the three maps that will change the world. We have Magellan in the lower corner to convince us that we are a marble we live on. We have the actual blue marble, which take note is blue and white, and we're gonna come back to that. And then we have a different kind of map, which is at the cross section of small satellites and machine learning. And I call this, along with other people, the functional map of the world. In other words, rather than see the blue, the blue marble, we're gonna start counting things, ships on the ocean, planes at airports, et cetera. So this is Washington, D.C. This is about seven centimeter resolution. It's very high fidelity for urban planning. And then we're going to superimpose the functional map of the world. So we counted and boxed 16,000 between Capitol and, and White House. And I want to explore the, the limits of that. And the title of the talk is, where does this data come from? And so. What is machine learning generally in the vision space? There are kind of three breakout areas, audio, vision, and text. I'm really just going to focus on vision here. And this is what's called a convolutional neural net. You can look at it as a big stack filter system. And in the lower corner, you actually see how a plane can be decomposed at the pixel level into many, many smaller features. So we actually can uncover we, we evolve from pixels. This is not edge detection. We're just evolving an airframe or a fuselage. The problem is typically these have 100 million parameters. It's a tremendous overfit, which means we need tremendous internet scale data. So can we use, the primary question is, can we use synthetic worlds to map to my dream of the real functional map? And the answer is yes. So here's a first case. Uh, one thing I mentioned about the white and blue marble 
is 50% of the chances of satellite photos are going to be cloud cover, right? Nothing really interesting, and you have to waste a lot of download space. So we want to synthesize weather at certainly not full overcast, but partial overcast, and see if we can recognize objects inside of it. So this is an example where we essentially remove clouds. We train a neural network on to recognize planes, and then we superimpose random mask of clouds. And it turns out we actually can see through clouds at a certain level. At some point, you need something like synthetic radar, aperture radar, but this is a kind of an interesting case of using synthetic world to get at the real world. Here's a second case, how do I fix a broken camera? So you can take, in the lower corner, we want to recognize this intersection, and we have about 30 centimeter resolution, a pixel, and then we're going to squash it and blow it back up. So we're basically going to lose information. And so the small sat is this sort of black and white thing at the top, and it turns out you can't recognize cars, but you can still see macro objects like the intersection. So we can use synthetic data to fix bad cameras. Finally, we want to ask, can I merge it with the video world? Can I drop models and train? And one of the complaints is my objects I want to recognize are unicorns. Maybe it's some odd object that we only have, we only have 20 aircraft carriers. How am I going to generate millions of versions of that? And one answer to that is to try video. The one thing that you should be, so I ge essentially generate dropped in 3D models and generate hundreds of images a second. And then we train on those, and the problem is I get 100% recognition. That tells me probably something's going on. I've memorized the actual object. And there's a reason for that, and one of the vulnerabilities of this overfit, this massive number of parameters, is I can train a neural net to recognize an elephant. I can train it to recognize a cat. I can wrap the cat in the elephant. It thinks it's an elephant. So at the, at the limit of what it sees, it doesn't see like we see. It actually is very sensitive to texture. And so now we want to exploit that. So when I talk about a shiny metal 3D CAD drawing, I've lost the texture of the actual airplane I'm looking for. So I want to explore that and basically ask the question, we have historically viewed color as camouflage to a machine texture is camouflage. So in essence, I can drop a crack or a net or a forest on top of this and begin to make guesses. It's no longer a plane, it's now a jigsaw puzzle, and so forth. And that shows an actually interesting application, just like with a stealth bomber, it learns how to deflect radar, I can essentially learn how to deflect shape detection by texture. So the conclusions are, where is the synthetic world going to help us? Generally, this is a well-developed field. It's called data augmentation. I rotate my images. I shear them. I change the brightness. I get many, many more examples. But really what I can't do is simulate interesting things that I will encounter in the real world from synthetic. One interesting case I think is promising is weather, just because we live on a white and blue marble. The other interesting case is I can simulate camera fixers. Resolution is under my control. Where it's probably not is the thing of simulating a unicorn, a rare object that we do not have millions of examples of. But finally, there is an opportunity there to exploit texture and not color as the new camouflage. Thank you. Did you want to hold questions till the end or? Okay, all right. So our next winner, Dr. Matthew Hitt, uh, comes to us from the U.S. Army. He's in the Space and Missile Defense Command. He got his uh, Ph.D. From, in mechanical engineering right here at UAH. Um, he's a general engineer and has conducted his research uh, primarily on additively manufactured fuel grains for axial injection and burning hybrid rocket motors and analysis of performance of satellite constellations. Did I get that right? You did. You okay. Did. Well, now you can tell us what all that means. So one of the things I would say looking back is I probably should have picked a research topic with a shorter name. Uh, but the question you may be asking is what is uh, an axial injection and burning hybrid rocket motor? And so here's a schematic of what it is. So for those of you that are not as familiar with hybrid rocket motors that are a form of chemical rocket propulsion, one form of, one of the propellants is in a solid phase, the other is in a liquid or gaseous phase. 
hence hybrid of liquid and solid propulsion, typically have a combustion chamber in the middle where all the action occurs. But in this particular configuration, the oxidizer is injected at the head end, flows through the grain without combustion to the end surface where the combustion occurs. This has two advantages. One, it increases the packing efficiency of the grain, so instead of having a lot of void space in your combustion chamber, you now have fuel. And two, it also burns a lot faster, which is one of the limiting factors for hybrid rocket motors. So there's some experiments on this, but then the question is, well, what could you actually do with this in a satellite application? So as I mentioned, regression rates higher follows a pressure base, took that data, fed it into a model, using ABS plastic as the fuel, so something that you could get off a 3D printer. It's basically Lego, safe, easy to handle, be good for small satellite operations and gaseous oxygen as the oxidizer, uh, partly because from before we had that data for the regression rate, so we could actually model that somewhat accurately. Then said, all right, coming up with a baseline configuration for the fuel grain, sizing the oxidizer uh, propellant mass for that, then was able to calculate the velocity change that you could provide to either a 3U, a 6U, or a 9U cube sat. So something fairly small, not looking at launching anything into space with this type motor configuration. So took that data. Obviously, you don't assume that it's going to be perfectly efficient. So we did different chamber pressures, different uh, characteristic velocity efficiencies. Did, of course, the ideal case, but also 90%. Something realistic. Uh, and based on all the calculations, came up with a specific impulse that you would expect somewhere around the area of 280 seconds, so realistic for chemical bipropellant motors, and then delta Vs of maybe around 450 meters per second for a 3U uh, satellite, 220 meters per second for a 6U, and then around 145 for a 9U. So a little bit of uh, delta V could do some missions, but then obviously led to the question of, well, is this good enough? You can do numbers and say, this is great. You can provide X amount of delta V, but is that really useful? So just for the assessment of how useful this is, did first went through, analyzed some different uh, orbital maneuvers that might occur, such as altitude raising, altitude maintenance, deorbiting, Phasing, one of the popular things with small satellites is constellations. So if you deploy them all in one position, what would it take to actually spread them out to get the coverage you desire? So taking those calculations for different maneuvers came up with a notional type uh, maneuver set for uh, 6U satellites. For instance, let's say you're deployed into a 300 kilometer parking orbit and you want to phase your orbit at three degrees per day, so that's about 43 meters per second. Then you want to raise your altitude to 400 kilometers for 57 meters per second, and then maintain your altitude for two years. That comes up to around 200 meters per second total of delta V required compared to the 220 meters per second that the model is predicting that the motor could provide. So it wouldn't be any fancy, exquisite mission. You're not going to be going circling around all the asteroids or anything, but a simple mission for a simple satellite in low Earth orbit. So overall, the models indicate that this type motor configuration would have potential use in a hybrid, uh, as a hybrid rocket motor propulsion system in a small satellite. And that was it. Okay, and our final winner is uh, Robert Hederich. Robert is an uh, aerospace engineer in the Advanced Concepts Office out at Marshall. Um, so congratulations to you. He has um, received his mechanical engineering degree from Lehigh University and an aerospace master's program was completed at Georgia Tech, no, I'm sorry, Georgia Institute of Technology, right? Okay. And your uh, focus is primarily on optimization, regression modeling, automation, and advanced design techniques applied to space systems. Okay? So please help me welcome. Sure. Okay. So um, 
So today I'm going to be talking to you briefly about a design study that I carried out. And um, so for this design study, we had to use some um, non-traditional sort of design techniques to carry out the optimization of the first stage solid rocket motor for the Mars Ascent vehicle. And so we can start this off by generally looking at a high level what the, the um, sample return mission looks like for, for this Mars mission of interest. So first we start out with the Mars 2020 rover being brought to the Martian surface where it's collecting samples. Several years after that, we're sending a lander, an ascent stage, and an orbiter to Mars. And the Mars 2020 rover will transfer its samples to a capsule located on the, um, on the ascent stage. That ascent stage will then launch from the Martian surface, and it'll transfer that sample capsule to the orbiter. And that orbiter will bring the capsule back to the Earth's surface where we can do you know, studies on the Martian material. And the team at Marshall Space Flight Center in particular is working on designing the Mars Ascent Vehicle portion of this mission. And so at the time that I was brought into the study, there was a need to refresh or update the design of the first stage solid rocket motor for the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And so they brought me in to carry out an optimization design study for this motor. So in this study, we were looking to maximize the total delta V of the first stage of the Mars Ascent Vehicle. And we wanted to maximize the, t the total ideal delta V because this gives us a good balance of maximizing the ISP while also minimizing the total inert mass of the motor and we can represent that in a single objective function. And traditionally, when we're carrying out this type of design study, we would essentially just take our, our design tool of interest. And so for, for this study, we're using the Solid Performance Program or SPP to simulate our solid rocket motors. We would wrap that in an optimizer and just run our optimization to convergence. However, due to the size of the design space that we were dealing with for this design problem, in order for any of our optimizations to converge, the um, optimizer needs to evaluate several thousand motors, so we need to evaluate SPP several thousand times for a single optimization. And with the amount of time that it takes SPP to run a single simulation or to evaluate a single parametric motor, the amount of time it takes to run a single optimization is very long, and to run the multiple optimizations we want to do, it's basically an infeasible amount of time to the point where we can't reasonably carry out our design study while using SPP in our optimization loop. So we need to utilize a different sort of methodology that helps us to speed up our parametric motor analysis um, without losing too much of our model fidelity that we want to have for evaluating the motors. To do this, we utilize surrogate modeling techniques. And so for those of you who are not familiar, a surrogate model is essentially just a regression model of your simulation environment. And so in order to create these surrogate models, we first need to um, automate our simulation environment. So we need to automate SPP and allow it to run in a batch mode so that we can run many, many motors through it in an automated fashion. After we've done that, we need to create a design of experiments which spans across our entire motor design space of interest. And we run that entire design of experiments through our batch mode environment, collecting all of the results. Once we've done that, we can actually look at any sort of outputs of interest from our motor sizing. So for this, for example, we might want to look at the maximum pressure of the motor, burn time of the motor, things like that that we either want to constrain or um, that are going to affect our objective function. And we create these regression models that can predict those outputs of interest anywhere in our design space. And so for this study, we had to use neural networks due to the nonlinearity of the design space. And so Obviously, we need to carry out some sort of validation verification to ensure that we're not doing any sort of overfitting and so that our models can predict well inside our design space. And then finally, we can kind of go back to where we started and try to re-implement our original optimization as we planned to, but this time, rather than using SPP in the optimization loop to evaluate our motors, we can now use these surrogate models in place of SPP to evaluate our motors. And by using these surrogate models in place, we can significantly speed, our, speed up our optimization. In this case, I was able to speed up the optimization about a thousand times while still not losing much of the um, general fidelity that we use to evaluate our motors. So after we got that optimization running, we um, ran through a variety of different optimizations. We optimized several different motors, 
So this is, this is just an example of one of those motors. That image on the top is the original baseline design for the Mars Ascent Vehicle first stage solid rocket motor. And the image below that is the same exact motor after we've run it through our optimizer with the surrogate models. And so you can see that um, our optimizer is primarily trying to pack the propellant in the motor as efficiently as it possibly could in order to shorten the motor because when we shorten the motor, the motor is going to weigh less because we have less casing and it also gives us more length for our nozzle to increase our ISP and generally improve the performance of the motor. And so for this motor in particular, we're able to have some pretty significant um, um, improvements to the, uh, the length of the motor and the general mass of the motor to improve the overall performance. So to kind of quickly wrap everything up, we started out this study with the goal of running an optimization, um, optimization study to improve the design of the Mars Ascent Vehicle solid rocket motor on the first stage. Using traditional methods, it seemed like this optimization would be infeasible to carry out due to long run times. However, using these types of surrogate modeling techniques, we were able to significantly speed up our optimization while still not giving up um, a significant amount of fidelity in our motor evaluations. And by the end of the study, we were able to generate and deliver a new um, motor design for the, 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 the MAV first stage to act as the new baseline with improved performance characteristics. Thank you.